Hello, everyone. I'm John Henry. I'm the director of the Flint Institute of Arts, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening to the 14th annual Community Gala Celebration. And as you can see from the image behind me, I'm addressing all of you um, in an empty theater where you would normally be sitting uh, and enjoying uh, this evening's uh, activities live. And as much as I would like all of us to be together this evening for the opening of the exhibition titled Posing Beauty in African-American Culture with a lecture by the curator of the exhibition, Dr. Deborah Willis, I'm grateful for today's technology that enables us to present what I believe will be a wonderful virtual event. Thank you all for tuning in. I'd like to compliment and thank the gala committee who believes so much in the importance and mission of the community gala that they found a way to continue what has become a highly anticipated celebration within our community here at the FIA. So with great ingenuity and perseverance, the committee was able to reimagine our customary community gala in tonight's virtual celebration. And shortly, we will hear from gala committee co-chair, Dr. Brenda Rogers Graves. Before we do, I wanna thank the Community Foundation of Greater Flint for sponsoring the exhibition. And as always, it's my pleasure to express our deep appreciation to the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, whose continued support enables the FIA to provide many memorable exhibitions and events like the ones we will celebrate tonight. I also wanna thank Huntington Bank for sponsoring Huntington Free Saturdays, which allows everyone free entry to the galleries every Saturday and for making tomorrow, Sunday, a Huntington Free Day as well. And I wanna thank especially the citizens of Genesee County for the Genesee County Arts Education and Cultural Enrichment Millage, which provides free entry to the FIA every day for all citizens of Genesee County. So now let's hear from Gala Committee Co-Chair, Dr. Brendan Rogers Graves. Good evening. On behalf of my co-chair, Kathy Bowes, and the 2021 Community Gala Committee, I would like to welcome you to the 2021 Community Gala Virtual Lecture. This evening celebrates the opening of Posing Beauty in African American Culture. Although we are unable to gather together, we think you're going to have an amazing time with Dr. Deborah Willis. I would also like to take this time out to thank you for your generous support that has made this virtual event possible. Sponsorships also help to support exhibitions and other programming at the Flint Institute of Art. We also encourage you to consider membership to the FIA, which starts at $30 and includes free admission, discounts at the museum shop, the Palette Cafe, and the FIA Art School. You also receive invitations to exhibition openings, lectures, and events like this. Again, thank you for joining us this evening and be sure to visit Posing Beauty in African-American Culture, opening January 31st through April the 13th. You won't be disappointed. Thank you, Dr. Rogers Grace. My name is Tracy Glab. I am, I'm the curator of collections and exhibitions at the Flint Institute of Arts. And I'm coming to you in this pre-recorded video to share an announcement about an upcoming exhibition with you. This time next year in 2022, we will present the exhibition, Sons, Seeing the Modern African American Male. Many of you may remember our popular and well-received exhibition, Women of a New Tribe, in 2017. The photographs of local Flint women created by artist Jerry Talaferro were wonderful and truly inspiring. So we jumped at the chance to bring him back on the fifth anniversary of that exhibition. This exhibition is different, not only because it focuses on men, but also because visitors will be presented with two photographs of each man. First, a black and white image of just a face. 
and then later a color photograph, much more than a photographic study, this exhibition aims to explore perceptions and biases. But like Women of a New Tribe, we want you to, we want to include African American men of the Flint community, and we're asking for your nominations to make this possible. Joining me in this video is Jerry Talapiro to tell us a little bit more about the exhibition. Hi, Jerry. How are you doing? Great. How are you? So what, tell us a little bit about, more about the, what, what got you interested in doing this exhibition and what, what people can expect. Well, uh, I can't take uh, credit for actually uh, coming up with an eye, not coming up with the idea. I have to give, uh, give that credit to uh, one of the curators where we did Women of the New Tribe. Uh, she asked when were we gonna do uh, the men. At first I thought she was joking, but she kept asking, so we had to take her seriously. And the exhibition is basically a little deeper than uh, Women of a New Tribe in that uh, it has a video component. Uh, where the men can uh, explain um, their experiences as a black male in America. Uh, we asked them several questions and the questions basically uh, explores, uh, you know, significant events in their lives that kind of uh, let them know that they were living in a different system. Um, some of it, sometimes they, it was little subtle events and sometimes they were traumatic events. Uh, the thing about the exhibition is to give people pause or to uh, let people think about, uh, you know, the black male experience. And they, the visitors to the exhibition are just a, as a big a part of the exhibition as the people in the exhibition, in that uh, they are asked certain questions, uh, you know, to consider. Uh, when you enter the exhibition, you are presented with a, a set of uh, anonymous pictures, black and white, and you're left to your imagination as to who that person is. And then you reveal the a color photograph and captions and video as to who that person is. And you have to kind of reconcile what you thought that, who you thought that person was and who that person really is. Uh, pretty simple concept. Well, I think it's going to be a really great exhibition, Jerry, and we're really, really happy to have you um, back in Flint. And you will be back sooner than later because the photo shoot will be this summer, right? Uh, or to, to dates to BD. <laughs> um, so there are two ways to, for um, everyone to nominate someone to be a part of this exhibition starting tonight. So we open up the nominations tonight. You, you can submit a paper form, which I'm holding here, and that can be picked up at the museum um, or, or you can all, and you can either drop that off at the museum or mail it in or you can submit a nominee uh, via our website on flintarts.org. So two ways to do that. We ask all nomination forms to be submitted by February 28th, so that uh, after this date, FIA staff and members of the Community Gala Committee will review the forms to ensure all the information is filled out and all the criteria has been met. These forms will then be entered into a drawing and participants will be randomly selected by the gala community gala co-chairs. Selections will be limited by space restrictions in the exhibition. Participants will be contacted to confirm their willingness to participate and a photo shoot, as we just mentioned, will be scheduled sometime this summer. So thank you, Jerry, uh, for being our special guest tonight. And I can't wait to see you in Flint later this summer. Any final uh, words or thoughts? Uh, you know, uh, my first experience in uh, Flint was so great, you know, I can't wait to get, get back and uh, work with people that I worked with before, which we were such a great group. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Jerry. We really appreciate you too. Um, have a good evening. You too. Thank you.
Okay. Good evening, everyone. This time I'm coming to you live from the Flint Institute of Arts. Before I introduce you to tonight's guest, Dr. Deborah Willis, I'd like to share a few housekeeping notes about this program. All participants are currently muted and your video is off, but you can ask questions or make comments via the Q&A button. We will make every attempt to get to all the questions at the end of the talk, time permitting. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Dr. Deborah Willis, who is also the curator of the exhibition Posing Beauty in African American Culture. Dr. Willis is university professor and chair of the Department of Photography and Imaging at the Tisch School of the Arts at New York University and has an affiliated appointment with the College of Arts and Sciences, Department of Social and Cultural Analysis, Africana Studies, where she teaches courses on photography and imaging, iconicity, and cultural histories visualizing the black body, women, and gender. Her research examines photography's multifaceted histories, visual culture, the photographic history of slavery and emancipation, contemporary women photographers, and beauty. She received the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Fellowship, as well as the John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship. Dr. Willis is the author of Posing Beauty, African-American Images from the 1890s to the Present, and co-author of The Black Female Body of Photographic History, Envisioning Emancipation, Black Americans and the End of Slavery, and Michelle Obama, The First Lady in Photographs, both titles an NAACP Image Award winner. Dr. Willis's curated exhibitions include In, per in Pursuit of Beauty, at Express Newark, Let Your Motto Be Resistance, African-American Portraits at the International Center of Photography, and Reframing Beauty, Intimate Moments at Indiana University. Since 2006, she has co-organized thematic conferences exploring imaging the Black body in the West, such as the conference titled Black Portraitures, which was held in Johannesburg in 2016. She has appeared and consulted on media projects, including documentary films such as Through a Lens Darkly and Question Bridge Black Males, a transmedia project, which received the ICP Infinity Award 2015, and American Photography, a PBS documentary. Please join me in giving a, Dr. Deborah Willis a warm virtual Flint welcome. Thank you, Dr. Willis. Great, thank you so much. This is really wonderful to be here, Tracy, and to and Rachel to um, spend this afternoon, evening with all of you. And I am really appreciative. Appreciate Kathy and Dr. Brenda for supporting this event, and you know just to have exceptional co-chairs. And the introduction to the exhibition was um, to the experience of Flint and all of the things that you're doing is really, really helpful. I'm, I'm gonna walk through tonight. Um, I know these virtual um, talks are interesting in, in many ways, but tonight I'm going to walk through an experience of framing beauty through um, this exhibition. It, it's exciting to see the installation and I feel like I'm there and I'm really happy to, to have the experience of the images. Uh, the exhibition is constructed in three sections and three themes, constructing a pose, body and image and modeling beauty and, and beauty contests. But photography has always been a space for me where I found my voice as an image maker and a writer. And I also see this as an ideal medium for advocacy. And it helps me reflect on the critical work that we're all doing with portrait making and image making. I'm going to begin to share my screen and begin the, the PowerPoint. And let's see. Um, the signature image here is of Susan Taylor, who is uh, central to many of us who are the experience of Essence Magazine and her work with CARE Mentoring Now. She is, continues to transform and try to understand the experience of mentoring and, and encouraging mentoring in, in, in multiple ways. This is um, introducing that image, but also the experience of 
what it meant um, for others, like an artist like Harry May Weems, to look at historical images and ask the question, I looked and looked and failed to see what so terrified you. She's asking the rhetorical question of the experience of the demeaning images that images of black people that have circulated and still circulate today. And she's wearing an antebellum type dress. She has a quilt, it's made out of a quilt fabric, but she's looking in the mirror in a, in a very earnest way because the images that she's responding to are the images by J.T. Zealy and, um, the, and, and Louis Agassiz. I just wanted to check my time, but she has images that you see. She's in it, you became a scientific profile, an anthropological debate, a Negroid type, and a photographic subject. Uh, and having these um, images that objectified Black people transformed uh, images about the humanity of Black people during um, slavery. Um, this is a image uh, created by Bayate Ross Smith, a photographer in New York, and it's called uh, My Kind of People or Our Kind of People. And he asked friends to dress in different ways in terms of hairstyles, hoodies, hats, Sunday best, work clothes, and, and asked people to respond. And similar to the upcoming exhibition that's um, happening on, on Black males. But here, this is what they, come together with and what do you see when you see certain people dressed in hoodies or scarves? And so that begins my sections as I walk through the sections of the exhibition. Body and image. There is an um, words, uh, there's a new, ex new book that I just published and it's, it was released yesterday. It's called The Black Civil War Soldier, A Visual History of Conflict and Citizenship um, through New York University Press. This is uh, an, an important moment for me because I, I think about the experience of the Civil War soldier that you know, memory and the personal memory, personal and public in terms of shaping the experience of, of that war four years, but rarely do we hear about the Civil War soldier. And I was interested in telling that story. Uh, Frederick Douglass says, once you let the black man get upon his person, the brass letter US, the bless, brass letter US, let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. You, there's no way that he, they're not citizens after fighting and preparing for the war. Frederick Douglass was one of the, um, has over 275 images. He's noted as one of the most photographed people in America, black, not black, but most photographic man in, in the 19th century. So thinking about how he used image as biography. I also um, wanted to show the work of women in terms of the Civil War, women who were actively involved in taking care of the men, uh, men who were women who were washermen, women, but the men who fought and the experience of posing um, for a photographer. We see her um, dressed in this calico dress style dress, but she's also has the American flag pinned her address. The photographer has hand tinted that image, red, white, and blue. So we see this sense of citizenship and the sense of pride. She also has the US brass button that possibly the soldier, a soldier gave to her. And thinking also through this broad history, we are looking at this, the profiling of, of, of black women. We see you became a scientific subject here and, and a model of, in terms of posing and then work um, by Anthony Barboza. Because such images, this image here of uh, Eugene Auger that, that um, humiliated and made mockery of black women's bodies. This is a, a roundabout, a merry-go-round where people could ride the backs of black women and, and take their families on the streets in Paris. This was also at the at an exhibition in, in Paris and the grotesque faces. And then we see Faux Wilson who creates a project looking at the objectification and then the desire of the black body. And here we see this, but uh, the, the bustle, the exa exaggerated because of the experience of said, uh, Sarji Bartman, the Hottentot Venus. So she creates this collage, this kind of 
working memory board of black women and white women and the desire and the sense of how black women have been perceived through art and history. Black photographers were working at the beginning of photography. Um, this is a work by Augustus Washington. Um, he uh, photographs the McGill family. They were uh, living in Baltimore, born in Baltimore. One of the first uh, people who migrate, migrated back to Bal migrated back to Africa to Liberia. And here, this is um, the family in a group portrait. He was a daguerreotypist in Hartford, Connecticut. He felt that America was not the place for um, black people to live. And moving to Monrovia, Li Liberia, he opened a Daguerrean gallery as well as um, he became an activist with politicians. And he was also an abolitionist here in this country. But we also see the importance of photography, the posing of the image. Um, his his uh, image here, we see the woman who is wearing a holding a daguerreotype case and the lace gloves of the 19th century, the popular images of that time. This is a ad from his studio in Hartford, Connecticut. We see it, um, his studio on Main Street, but also the history of, of slavery and that experience of, of we know why the Civil War. But we also know that Black people self-emancipated. This is an image uh, of a runaway um, slave ad as it's known. And it's a, I see this as a woman who self-emancipated, her name was Dolly. Her owner, um, Louis Manacle, had placed these ads, posters in police stations in Augusta, Georgia and in South Carolina. He says that she ran away from his um, plantation, uh, this corner of Jackson and Broad Street. Um, her name is Dolly, whose likeness is seen here. So he has her photographed prior to, um, you know, during her lifetime. She is 30 years of age, light complexion, hesitates somewhat when spoken to, with a fine set of teeth, um, not healthy, but rather good looking. So we see this experience that he is desiring her back. He's saying that she was enticed off by some white man um, and not knowing the city that she was in. So here we see this sense of beauty, rather good looking. And we see this concern for her, but also that he had her photographed at a, for a $50 reward for her return. Uh, soldiers, uh, Civil War soldiers, they took their families to, to photographer studios. Um, to make sure that their families remembered, but also the families had images to share. This is, these are two images that I, I find fascinating through the war. Lewis Douglas, the, the son of Frederick Douglas, he entered the war with the 54th Mass. Um, he fought in South Carolina. He sent letters to his fiance, Amelia Logan, who lived in upstate New York. And one letter says, my dear girl, while I'm away, do not fret yourself to death. I, you know, I beg you not to worry. He's really concerned that, you know, about her, but he's fighting for humanity and he's looking for a change. So here we see how his pose, comportment of his body, and then her face and her look in terms of that exchange of the images and posing. Um, Couples posed as they left for uh, for war, um, husbands left for war. So this is a Connecticut uh, couple, uh, a soldier dressed in uniform and his wife. And another image just that was uh, organized by lieutenant, white lieutenants in, in the place where they were um, in Rock, Rock Island, Illinois. Um, they wrote on the back of the image in terms of the describing the men in their camps. Emmett Adams reads well, makes the morning reports. And you see the way that he, he conducts himself well in terms of his posing in the image. So here we see this sense of body and image. We also see the counter image where a free man who joins the war, um, but he feels, I think his, his life changed. And this says, James Roberts drummer was a free man hard, and now he's hard to manage. Um, and now he's stubborn and reckless and he's a bass drummer. Compared to the, his, his posing in this image 
we see his hat tilted to the side, his jacket open, and we see this sense of uh, identity formation through the posing of this image. Image Marguerite, a, a woman who was uh, in, emancipated and she, her style of dress, a large eight by 10 um, tintype. And then also this it, contemporary photographers and artists and filmmakers are looking at historical image as I, as I think about memory and how do we go look through ways to tell stories. This is a photograph of JP Ball on the left and an image that Isaac Julian created in reflection of, of Ball. As he creates the Ball studio, this is J.P. Ball, who was a photographer and abolitionist in Cincinnati. He also lived in Helena, Montana and Seattle, Washington, and, and, and finally uh, lived in, in Hawaii. But here is an installation of his studio as people looked through this great gallery in his salon wonderful experience, uh, Lessons of the Hour that was organized by Isaac Julian in an exhibition in San Francisco, where he recreates J.P. Ball's studio and the figure in the back figure is, is Ball, as, as in the other figure seated at the table, we imagine as uh, Frederick Douglass, as they're looking at the image, looking at, at the experience of photography, seeing citizenship and rights, through the act of photographing and creating this image, reflecting on the black male image and the black woman image, Anna Mary Douglas, uh, Douglas's wife, also in the image. And this is framed with a mirror as if reflecting on history. So contemporary artists are looking at these, his, at these histories, um, this strange history, but also beautiful history and looking through the lens of beauty. W.B. Du Bois ex order, organized an exhibition for the Paris um, Exposition of 1900. And this is an installation of the area of the exhibition that it was called, entitled A Small Nation of People, where he had 360 images of, of Black uh, people photographed in the Atlanta, Georgia or Georgia area and on display also with figures, historical figures and artifacts in the exhibition. And there's a photograph of W.B. Du Bois. Family images were seen as in albums and, and just imagine them in terms of biblical sense. There's, it's in an album, there's leather bound, images of, of a woman, a tintype, and then another popular image, always thinking of you. So the heart and love of, of celebrating image making. Headquarters of the colored women's voters. So 1913, Black women were determined to be a part of the suffrage movement and decided that they wanted to vote and create a way for women to have a voice in voting, not here 100 years later. This is a celebration now in terms of 1920. Black women had a difficult time um, within this experience, but they were determined to live there, sit through that citizenship. We have um, Ida B. Wells, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, the image of, of Madam C.J. Walker and Ida B. Wells was very active with the um, suffrage movement. And this image here of women working, uh, women who were, and, and so the, the every day, how the postcard was used in terms of this experience. And here's a young woman by the name of Maggie, uh, who's sending a note to Maggie. Um, she says, writes on the back of the postcard, how are you doll? I'm coming to see you on Saturday before long. Here's a photo of me. I, I see you laughing now and love to all, write me when you're able. But the joy of being photographed and then to describe the self-conscious image is seen in this sense of, of citizenship and, and love of family images. Image uh, of a woman making uh, an American flag, knitting an American flag, and another woman made, uh, and these are both in uh, one in, in the South, Savannah, Georgia, the other in South Carolina, sorry, Charleston, South Carolina is the typo. And a mother um, combing hair. And so we see that range because there were national types of beauty cards circulated during this time in the 1920s. Black women were not a part of that discussion. Here we see Anna Mae Wong in terms of how she's viewed in this card. And I was determined to try to find this objectified image of, of women, but it was fascinating to see this image says, 
20, 36 actual photographs as men smoked and desired looking at beauty and women. Here, this is an image here, 50 real photographs now being packed with, with cigarettes. And this is of Josephine Baker. So we begin to see again, this sense of desire through images and through smoking. And Josephine Baker was savvy about her image and she understood her style and her dance. She created the Baker Fixed so that people could create a hairstyle. And here, these are parts of the stories. Women who decided to be entertainers, to work outside of the stereotype of domestic work and, and, and use their artistry. So these are women who were who sent postcards. These are part of women who were on, on migrating to the North and through the South to teach. And these are images that were sent to family members as well as to schools where they taught. And so we see this changing, the constructing a pose that posing, this is Hugh Magum's um, image in North Carolina. He, his studio had blacks and whites entering into the studio. Um, normally, and it's unusual because in the South, there were images that were times where it says whites um, enter only on certain days, blacks on another. Um, here we see this image, we see the, the range of people who visited his studio on and the posing that is on this this image of style with a striped blouse. We see white figures, we see black figures, couples and young people. And his studio portraits are just amazing to see. Family photographs. Here is a black photographer. You can see his reflection in the mirror, photographing a family in their house in Indianapolis. Um, a young girl holding her doll, there's a dog. Um, the father has a photograph facing out and the mother is reading. We see the art on the wall and we see the art on the mantle. So we see the sense of beauty and living within it. And I love this construct in this constructing a pose, this kind of cool pose sending a message. Uh, and this is uh, another postcard that's circulating. And Zora Neale Hurston, when she received the photograph by Carl Van Vechten, she says, I like this, she says, Carl, darling, send the pictures here. I like myself when I'm looking mean and impressive. So here um, we see this range of image that she is exploring of herself and, and how she's responding to it in that way. Um, Carter Brasson was in Harlem in the 40s and he photographed um, brown, the, the Harlem brown skin models on Easter Sunday. And this sense of decisive moment where we see this exchange of image of looking. Um, Teeny Harris in Pittsburgh, you know, a waitress takes a moment to, at the Crawford Grill, takes a moment to pose, the smile. But we see the liveliness of this experience, a woman who's wearing evening clothes, uh, probably out for the evening for an event, and another man who has wearing worker clothes. And we see the range of the experience of life. This is really important as I think in the, as I research um, beyond the book to consider headdress and head wraps. And this is a, a woman from uh, Suriname uh, and we see her head wrap and her, her beads and her beauty. And I thought about the experience of head wraps during the 1930s where people felt um, ashamed in the 60s where uh, Black people were felt ashamed of wearing their head wrap. So here we see a woman who is um, desired in terms of her look and her head wrap and the respect of her head wrap. We see the contemporary artist today, Elaine Rodriguez, is working on a project also on in Suriname culture, and she's follow me and my and and my train of thoughts and the head wrap she's photographing now in Amsterdam. And we see this experience of a woman who has a different type of head wrap. And we see the beauty and the sense of confidence. But going back to Gone with the Wind in 1939, when this film was made, that uh, people were ashamed of the fact of, the, of Hattie McDaniel's character who wore her head wrap. Um, she, you know, the, the loop. But Hattie McDaniel's won an Oscar for her role. Um, we see her with uh, red lipstick. We see her with earrings. And we see um, the sense of, story that she wanted to tell of black women who wrapped their heads to protect it from 
the, the elements, the weather, um, protected from all kinds of experiences that happened during slavery and, you know, during that time period as, as reenacted in the film. Um, in the 1920s, people entered James Van Der Zee's studio and, and people he photographed on the streets of Harlem. James Van Der Zee's couple in the car is a well-noted image to this photograph of a photographer, Zach Brown, photographing two dapper dressed men in Harlem in the 1930s. So we know and we can see how Harlem is, is an exciting place to be, but also that the photographer, Elliot um, Ellison, photographs the photographer who's photographing these two men. And so this kind of joy, but also the images that were made of Howard University students who were standing outside of, the, of Congress with no, noose around their necks um, because they're um, determined to get a bill against, to stop lynching. And they are dressed for the winter, but also having the noose around their, their neck. Because of the images like that, like the images of, of Mammy images that were in the 1939 image of Gone with the Wind, we see these restaurants, and this is in Natchez, Mississippi. The Mammy image on the left was made by Edward Weston in 1941, and there's a contemporary image in 2015. The same restaurant that here, again, we see the woman, a uh, black figure as a servant entering also sexualized because you enter into her skirt. Um, so these are moments that, that circulated for a long time. And this is why there are so many images that contemporary artists are combating that Mary Simbande says caught up in the rapture of this history of domestic work. And here she says that she creates a, a cape, superwoman cape for the S, but it's for the Simbande women, four generations of domestic workers. And she creates this huge sculpture that's made in 2009. Gordon Parks, uh, activist photographer, followed, uh, was in Mobile, Alabama, documenting the colored entrance where uh, a young woman who is taking her, her niece to a movie theater. And we see her dressed on her Sunday best. The way that Gordon used red in this image, we, we kind of follow the, the lead of the colored entrance, neon sign, as, as he's watching the, the, cup, the, the two figures in the foreground. On the left is an image that he was a photographer for a magazine called Smart Women Magazine. And this is a photograph of Gordon's first wife, Sally. And this is the Christmas issue where she's hope, she, she was also a hat maker. So here we see her with her stylized hat, but he creates this sense of desire and express women, black women shopping and moving through the streets. And this is, that was in, in 1940s. In 1950s, this is an image of a, of a family of women taking their, grand, their son, grandson, and nephew to school for the first day in 1957. We see a woman who creates her dress. You see the little bow on the back. We see a sense of you know looking at beauty as political, but also see me as human as they walk through um, this white woman who's holding the door basically blocking them, daring them to enter as the three children on the left look on. It's a powerful image when we think about desegre desegregating the schools in Nashville. A powerful story looking at this. Muhammad Ali, as he's posed in terms of constructing a pose, telling his story about his plight to fight, to Malcolm X photographed by Eve Arnold, um, just a moment to you know, as she captures him, as he's reflecting uh, and thinking about his next thought in terms of next word as he's in transition to speak. Um, we see the ring nation of Islam ring. Uh, we see his hat tilted. And then Lola Flash, uh, photographer here in, in, in New York, photographing lesbian women, lesbians in, in New York and, and also in, in England and other places, but photographing them on the rooftop and giving them power in their voices and empowering their visual experience and their life.
um, Isaac Hayes, um, photographed by Ernest Withers in his office, and Angela Davis. And seeing Angela in, in this pose, the power of, of the image, the power of this image of Isha Evans, and in terms of this constructing a pose where she is at in Baton Rouge, stopping um, this experience of, as, as she's arrested as well. But here, the power of this image and her pose that the photographer, Jonathan Bachman was able to, to capture this and the power of this moment when we think about this pose and, and the sense of what she is basically saying about enough and enough, enough. And modeling beauty in contest. This is a Pacific Beach Club, 1925, labor um, in, in, in California, Labor Day um, celebration. This is a wonderful moment where people, Black people are living in, in leisure life in California. It's, it's, they're posed in front of their beach club. There's a large crowd. We see them owning their space and their land, owning their own leisure life. You know, and having this moment. Three days um, later, this beach club was burned down by the racist people in the community. You know, just the experience of owning and building and finding a space, but also to also create beauty contests for these women. Um, John Johnson had uh, magazines: the Ebony Magazine, the Jet Magazine, Tan Magazine, and we see the the experience of of blackness and color that he used the spectrum of a black to, to talk about uh, celebrating black beauty through Jet, using women on the cover of the magazine. Hank Willis Thomas created an installation um, for um, Jet Beauties. And this is a photo installation in the exhibition. Um, the, it's called Black is Beautiful. And he went through the centerfold of all of the Ebony magazines that he could find and created an insulation of wallpaper that um, these images of models and Kwame Brathwaite photographing the Grandessa models and, 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 and their photographs are seen, Lou Donaldson's album cover. And here we see little black dress, natural hairstyle, beauty, and in the sense of working through the aspect of modeling and framing beauty. This is um, Jeffrey Scales photograph at a, at a barber shop and Carrie Mae Weems again sitting at the kitchen table, you know, teaching um, how to perform beauty. Um, Latoya Ruby Frazier with her grandmother, you know, the braids and the moment of beauty and sharing these um, moments of generations. The image of by Hank Willis Thomas of Bayate Ross Smith with the um, Nike swoosh on the head. So we, we see this as a way of looking at the history of slavery and the and consumerism. And here we are, you know, in terms of that history is followed through with this framing. And we think about hair at this moment in, in the 60s with Kathleen Cleaver, who is part of the Black Panther Party, to Lauren Kelly experiencing um, the moment of beauty through Afro picks, and she creates a crown um, that's of uh, the fists and the crown to Zanelli Maholi in 2019 is also using the Afro pick in using these hair instruments to create crowns in, in this work. Renee Cox sits on the crown of the Statue of Liberty, Lady Liberty, and she says chilling with uh, Lady Liberty. She sees herself as Rajay, creating a sense of, of empowerment for women to change the world. And Carrie again, um, modeling beauty, creating a sense of Angela Davis in the back with her Afro to a woman who's modeling. And looking at Delphine Fuwondu, who is looking at um, the experience of blue eyes, blonde hair, and how did you find me as beautiful and desirable? So these are these ranges that we see through Omar, Omar Victor Diop, um, makeup artist and the style of dress in, in that experience. Um, 
Odidiri, um, um, fortunately, a Nigerian photographer who passed away recently, and hairstyles that are part of this. Roshini Kempadu, about face, where she's, you know, we look in our cell phones daily and to check ourselves, to check our beauty, to acknowledge our beauty, to share our beauty. And, and, and photographers are looking at history. This is a photograph um, by Lippmann, the photographer who's selling the shoe um, ad, but looking at the history of Benoit's photograph of an enslaved woman, a portrait of an enslaved woman, and trying to create that same image. The, the painting from the 1800s to a 21st century image, but holding that, that shoe. To Tyler Mitchell's photograph, of Beyonce, um, she was on the cover of Vogue. We see this posing, the style with the, the aspect of using the, the domestic um, clothesline. You know, you, we see that. And then also the way that she, he's using the headdress, the flowers to enhance the beauty and to remind us of nature, but also the domestic work of women. Carrie Mae Weems again, um, she created this piece um, on Mary J. Blige, um, and it's called, um, it's a safety curtain in Vienna. And she has this piece that is uh, an exhibition that just covers the curtain. And she uses elements of beauty from Mary J. Blige style to the swan, um, to the white swan, to flowers to um, African art and mirrors. And so affirming beauty, just imagine people who are waiting for the concert to begin and to look at the curtain. And they, it's an exhibition project that the Vienna uh, Opera House has um, initiated and it's, it's called Museum in Progress. But it, it, an opportunity for artists to show and create work. And Joy Gregory's um, work um, lipstick and this close up, you know, image um, experiencing this. And it's this wait, wonderful moment to experience to Miles Davis's closet by Anthony Barboza. I mean, imagine the closet of Miles Davis, the experience that he is sharing of his clothes, his style, and when he knows. Um, he's ready to perform or walk the streets or have that experience. Um, Anthony Barboza was there to document that closet. And so this is um, the end of the, ex the talk and the exhibition. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and open up for our questions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Willis, for such an insightful and interesting talk. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the community gala co-chairs, Dr. Brenda Rogers Grays and Kathy Bowles, who will moderate the Q&A period. So um, just give us a moment while we get their cameras turned on. Um, and then I'm gonna turn mine off. Okay. And please, Dr. Brenda, uh, turn your camera on. Dr. Willis. Yes. We are delighted to have you with us this evening. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. What is your favorite photograph, uh, photographs in the exhibition? Hmm, <laughs> they're all my favorite. It was a, it was a hard choice to, um, to um, select the image and to edit. But the cover image is, is one that I, I find I found told the story best um, as we think about history and historical images of women and to find a way to identify beauty without hair um, through you know hoop earrings and to the experience of of, of women who. <clears throat> who understood the beauty from the hairstyles 
to um, dress. So I think that that was, that's my um, most striking image. But Carrie Mae Weems's image also is one of my favorites. So I have a, a few favorites, but that's one. <laughs> All right. Dr. Willis, it's just a pleasure and honor to, for you to be here with us this evening and sharing your expertise with our with our uh, all the people that joined us today. Uh, my question to you is, as both photographer and photo historian, what advice would you give to people on how to look at and interpret photography? Well, I, you know, we, we all enter into photography from personal experience and memory of, of how we respond to experiences on photography on the wall or photography in on our phone. And so I would, enter into um, inv advise people to think about what stories are being told by both the photographer and the subject. What, how the subject wants to explore their identity through posing and through dress. So I'm, I'm always asking people to have an open look in terms of that, that shared moment mm -hmm. of how do you see yourselves in these images, but also to ask the question of, of how do you feel when you see it? You know, that reflective feeling when you, does it make you feel uncomfortable? Such as the images we saw this summer with the um, protest and the, the unfortunate death of, of George Floyd to the images that we see in the exhibition where we see, um, we, wanna make, we wanna make a change. So images are able to help us make a change and to believe in something, you know? So that's, that's where I, I ask people to have that stretch, that range. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Willis, Posing Beauty is a project that grew out of your graduate level photography seminars, as well as your own research. What surprised you the most about this project and what you discovered? The, um, that, that beauty is political. That's something that surprised me and that also beauty is power. And the experience of, and, and I, and I in, incorporated black and white photographers as well as Asian and, and, and Latin X photographers to be a part of the history and the movement because I, was, I wanted different perspectives um, from women photographers as well. So I wanted different voices and having that opportunity to have the range of voices to explore uh, beauty helped me understand that uh, beauty is transformative and that's um, and healing and that's something that I, I, I learned from this project. What advice would you give to young scholars, curators, or photographers? As um, people to show their work or to people to study. I'm, I'm advising students all the time. <laughs> so as I think about my own students, I tell them to work, continue to make images. You know, we, people ask questions about, well, the cell phone camera is using, taking up, everyone has, can take a picture. I said, but everyone can't tell your story. And I believe that people who have their cameras, um, individual cameras can tell their story and to continue to tell. I, I know a lot of people get um, discouraged and, and say that they're not gonna make any more images, they're gonna stop making images. And so that the way to tell that story is um, to encourage them to continue making images is to say, make the photographs, keep working, and keep making photographs, and I mean, you know, that's my, that's my mantra. And I even tell um, seasoned photographers the same, and 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 people who are collecting photography, I still say the same. Continue to look at images, and and that that's an experience. In other words, don't give up. Don't give up. <laughs> yeah. Don't give up. Right. What do you What do you hope that visitors come away with after they visit this exhibition? Well, that um, we, um, that black people had a range of experience, life experiences, and not to look at um, that, that, that the range of stories about black 
stories that are visualized by people as as complex and you know different desires the experience of that the evidence of photography shows the the intellect of of the of black subjects in the images but also shows the artistry of the experience and of the artists who created the work but also that the ideas of how do we consider um, the the memory of beauty that has been erased um, in this in, in in our history in American history of black people and not until we understand that we believe in ourselves and we believe in in the identity of of democracy for for all that we can have a desire to to live freely and that's something I hope that people walk away with in this exhibition. Okay. This, this is the last question from uh, on behalf of Dr. Brendan, myself. And now after I ask this question, we'll go to the questions from the audience. So our last question from Dr. Brendan, myself are, with so many images and photographs competing for our, our attention online, what do you see as the future of photography especially in terms of African-American um, African American representation? Um, it, it goes back to my other um, question is, um, I, my other answer is that to be, we need to stay aware of, of photography. I think that with new media and the images that are creating with gaming, images that are creating through the videos and now that we're home more often that we have Netflix and, and other um, opportunities to, to look at images from a wide range of channels, you know, Sundance, and Netflix, to HBO, and through the networks, we need to be able to see and to be able to decipher what stories are being told through these images. And how do we tell these images? Some of them are horrific. Since January 6th, I still feel pain when I see those images. But then through the inauguration, I felt joy um, and looking at those images. So we need to continue to make images and disseminate images that, that uplift and also um, that are traumatic. So that's that, that experience that I believe that we should continue on. Well, thank you. We are going to take uh questions from the audience and I have a question ready to go and mm -hmm. the question is how do you think the white aesthetic has impacted the black aesthetic and how do you see that translated through pictures um so what it you know I you know that's a question I rarely take on because Whose aesthetics? What what it, what what are aesthetic aesthetics? So that's something that I I find difficult to um, to kind of frame. Um, so when I think about the aesthetics of beauty, um, it's it's a range. So it's I, I'd like the second question. What is the question the person really wants to know? Because the sense of the black aesthetic is style of dress. The white aesthetic is is the style of dress. You know, um, hairstyles are the same. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious about what it, what the real question is in that. So I'm, I'm struggling with that question. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I don't have it unless you have an answer to that, Kathy. It would be helpful. Well, but, I, but well, what I tried to show not, but <laughs> <laughs> I sure was hoping you had a question. Right. But what, but what I try to do is this with my experience is to explore the range of experiences that we could tell through image making. So image making through Gordon Parks' photograph of his first wife holding um, a Christmas um, presents. What aesthetic is that? That is aesthetics of joy, you know? Um, so that's where I struggle with that, that question without finding out what the actual question that person wants to know. <clears throat> Dr. Willis, I have a question. Uh, did your doctoral work serve as a gateway to this vast body of work? No, my undergraduate work. Uh, when I was an undergraduate student in photography, um, 
there were no African Americans in my history books. Um, photographers. That caused me to spend a lifetime, which I really thought it was just going to be an undergraduate paper, looking for Black photographers. But it, I've spent the past, I can't believe it's 40 years now, um, looking for Black photographers and Black, and Black images to incorporate in an exhibition and books to make sure that students didn't have the same experience that I had. So um, I, I, by the time I went to graduate school for a PhD, I had the time to collect images, to interpret images in a different way. And so it really started as an undergraduate student. While we continue to wait for uh, some additional questions to come in from our uh, people online, uh, I have another question for you. And that is, you have mentioned that you were inspired by this quote by Toni Morrison, which is, and I quote, beauty was not simply something to behold, it was something one could do. What do you think we can do to enact beauty in our everyday lives? Um, you know, my mother gets up every morning. My mother is 90, she'll be 99 in two weeks. She gets up every morning and on the phone and she said, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Mm -hmm. That is what we can do is get up and be rejoiceful and be glad in it. And I think that that's exactly what Toni Morrison said, that um, how do we consider um, beauty is just do it just believe in that you're doing good work and um, that people are, you know, and beauty reflects beauty. And that's something that I believe in terms of that experience that Toni Morrison has written about. And, and I reflect on it when I read her words that she is considering that as a framework to live by and she lived by in her words. And it has been said that beauty is, an, is the eye of the beholder. So yes. it's what you think is beautiful exactly. is beautiful. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Dr. Willis, I've heard you speak on numerous occasions and you often talked about growing up in the presence of images and pictures at home. In addition to that experience, you spoke about your family being involved in laying the foundation. This had to be amazing. Can you tell the audience about this? Uh, well, I grew up in a house full of family photographs. Um, my father um, made a number of images as um, with his camera. His, his cousin had a photography studio and our neighbor was the photojournalist um, in, for the newspaper, for the black newspaper in, in, in Philadelphia and for the Philadelphia Tribune. So uh, growing up with images that uh, people really enjoyed posing, um, I had 50 first cousins. So I had, you know, 26 aunts and uncles <laughs> on both wow. sides. So the, the joy of family and the joy of memory and memorializing our events stayed with me. And I think that that's one of the, the experiences I wanted to share uh, when I became um, a photographer and a teacher, that in order for us to, um, to find joy in our lives, we have to continue to make photographs. Thank you. Uh, we have a question, uh, Dr. Willis, from one of our uh, viewers, and that is, how would you imagine this African-American ex exhibit might differ from a similar collection of African European photography exhibit. And how, how unique. Say it again. Uh, I'm the sorry. question is, is how would you imagine this African American exhibit might differ from a similar collection of African European photography exhibit? And how unique is the African or how unique is the American an experience to the worldwide black community? Mm -hmm. Well, this exhibit has African photographers in it who live in Africa. So it's not um, um, just um, African American. And the experience is Omar Victor Jop's images. Um, 
highlights my life in terms of the images that he created with um, the fashion and makeup artist where we see the, the dress, the elaborate style dress that we see in the exhibition. And in the talk, I include African photographers and artists as well because I'm fascinated with their storytelling and, and the way that their images are, are mirroring our experiences. Uh, we talk about politics in our images. We talk about hair in our images. Um, we talk. We look at family and 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 fashion. And what I love about photographing and meeting photographers in South Africa is that they're not um, blinded by not the difficult that they're do difficult experiences that they have in, in, in some of the places that they're living, they're finding also the, the worthiness of their lives by documenting and making images of the artistry of the women there and the men who are fashion designers, who are making um, endebele um, paintings on the walls. So that's the experience I, I see in it. And when I think about images uh, in Mali or in Ghana or Nigeria, it's the same. Um, the, it, the photographers are photographing the activism um, in their communities, but also photographing the day-to-day -day experience. And, you know, I, a story that I had when I was in Nigeria where we were going out and, and, and the woman who was taking me out said, uh, so I, I had my little black dress on, my, you know, my New York little black dress. And she said, where are you going? You know, you, you can't go out like that. You need to come to my house and get dressed. And, and, I, and I loved, she said, you know, one thing about black Americans, they're always talking about beauty and, you know, the blah, blah, blah. We know we are beautiful, you know? And that was, that was you know, the here, you know, the, this woman, Nikkei is her name, but for her to just kind of, you know, I thought I was beautiful in my little black dress, but no, she needed to. She needed to tell me that I need a dress that made a made a statement about me, and it was wide, it was colorful, and it just really just made me feel like, oh yeah, this is very princely, queenly, you know, royally, you know, all of those moments that I never wear, feel when I have my little black dress on, mm. and so that's the experience that I think depicts the, the range of um, experience that we have, um, the difference in terms of how we as um, American photographers looking through our closets um, and, and making a statement. And, and, and I, I love that experience. Um, I, I've never talked about that till just now with that question, but I just still remember the difference that I felt um, in dress during that time. So I think that was the last question, right? Because I know we said we end at seven, is that correct? I have one more. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, Dr. Willis, I think you got this audience file uh, fired <laughs> up. Because <laughs> I have another really good question. And it says, can you explain the art behind little Kim's photo? She is a symbol for so many, but I would love to hear your perspective. Oh. I don't have it in front of me right now. Um, that photograph is by Aggie Ogborn. And I know that the, the image is, is an older image. And it just, I think it talks about, you know, um, consumerism and money and that aspect of style that she was pre presenting and projecting that time. And I think that that's what's in that exhibition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a question mm -hmm. and that is, what do you currently think of the depiction of black beauty in today's media? And have we progressed or regressed? I think we um, are continuing to make a difference um, and it's beautiful. And we, I, we are progressing. I don't see it as regression um, or I think that that's something that we are experiencing. So I think that that's, the media has, and, and it, before the media had one, um, one train. <laughs> so we have multiple um, experiences 
when we look at um, our, our life today in media. And so we have fashion designers, you know, we have makeup artists, um, we have stylists and we have artists and we see it, they're doing their work every day. Dr. Willis, mm -hmm. what kind of images are you currently curating for your next exhibition? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm working um, at my, for my own work. I love to, I'm working on a project on closets. I'm photographing people's closets. Oh my god. And it's called, <laughs> 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 and you know, we all have clothes in our closets that we can't wear, but we don't give away. <laughs> and, and they have stories. And, and, and I believe that closets tell stories. And, and, I mean, I'm working with that aspect of it, photographing closets and creating an exhibition about closets and, and the experience of beauty in our closets. I, I personally can't wait to see that. <laughs> um, <laughs> So um, we're so uh, glad you took so much time with us in answering all these questions. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get to them all, um, but I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. So thank you, Dr. Willis. Um, thank you, co-chairs Kathy Bowles and Dr. Brenda Rogers Grays. And thank you most of all to our sponsors who were so generous um, and we really, really appreciate your support. It's been a lovely evening and the Posing Beauty exhibition is open through April 18th starting tomorrow during normal museum hours. Tomorrow, by the way, is um, a Huntington free Sunday. I hope to see you all at the museum sometime during the run of the exhibition. For more information on visiting the FIA and our current COVID-19 safety protocols, please visit our website, flintarts.org. And have a great evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.